And still talking security, former governor of Lagos State, Ashiwaju Bola Tinubu, has condoled with the government and people of Kaduna State over recent terrorist attacks which have left many killed and others kidnapped. Ashiwaju Bola Tinubu, who was accompanied by former governor of Borono State, Senator Kashim Shatima, announced a donation of 50 million, to, 50 million naira to victims of the attack. And Lupe Asom reports. The national leader of the All Progressive Congress, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, arrived in the Kashim Ibrahim House in Kaduna. He's accompanied by some senior political office holders. Asiwaju Tinubu have come to sympathize with the governor and people of Kaduna over the recent train attack by terrorists, where government figures confirmed that eight people were killed. And governor Nasu Erufai was pleased by his visit and even displayed a rare gesture of ceding the designated seat of the executive governor to Asiwaju Bola Tinubu. The visiting former Lagos governor outrightly condemned the attack on innocent citizens. He says the fight against terrorism should be given a collective effort. What happens to a people on the Kaduna to Abuja train was a disaster for all of us. We need to fight the terrorism with all aspects of our energy, whatever we have. Once it happens to one, it happens to all. He then presented his condolence letter before donating 50 million naira to the Kaduna government for the rehabilitation of the victims. Kaduna state government officials thanked their visitor for this kind gesture. And Governor Nasu Erifa admitted that unlike other leaders, Bola Tinubu is a man full of empathy and a great leader who seeks to unify Nigerians. This gesture by Asiwaju is a show of powerful leadership, empathy and concern for the lives and property of Nigerians. The government and people of Kaduna State will never forget this gesture. The governor also promised to be part of the political engagement aimed at actualizing the presidential aspiration of Bola Tinubu. And we are aware of your aspiration to be the president of this country. And we look forward to further engagement so that we can progress that project. Outside, a crowd had already gathered to catch a glimpse of Bola Ahmed Tinubu, a political leader that is revered, loved and cherished by many. And this was proved to the swelling support base of Bola Ahmed Tinubu in northern Nigeria and puts him in pole position ahead of the 2023. The next stop was at St. Gerard's Hospital, where Bola Tinubu commiserated with the hospital over the loss of one of their doctors, Chinelu Megafo, who died in the train attack. He also visited Sheikh Dahiru Bauchi at his residence before departing Kaduna. Lupe Asom, TVC News, Kaduna. In the nation's capital, where President Muhammad Buhari has signed an executive order for the implementation of the national building, public building maintenance policy. Now, this executive order now ties maintenance of federal government owned buildings directly to the economy and will ensure that ministries, departments and agencies operate a functional maintenance department and make necessary procurement to carry out its responsibilities. The president signed this executive order at the opening of this week's Federal Executive Council meeting at the presidential villa in Abuja. It says this critical policy will create jobs for small businesses, skilled laborers and artisans in the country. He also urged state and local governments to adopt this policy and see maintenance as not just a culture, but as a conscious driver of economic growth. President Buhari says the federal government has consciously started the implementation of maintenance of strategic facilities like the federal secretariat in Abuja and 24 states of the federation. While it is true that our economy has been diversified and the non-oil sector is leading in terms of contribution to the gross domestic product, the maintenance and facility management component of the services sector is an opportunity that is waiting to be maximized. It is my hope 
that this order will open the door to this treasure of opportunities for young technicians, for artisans, for vendors and suppliers, and for small businesses and cottage industries. And now to the oil and gas sector. Members of the National Union of Petroleum and Natural Gas Workers, NUPENG, are demanding an end to outsourcing and casualization of workers in the oil and gas industry. At the fifth quadrennial delegates conference of NUPENG in Asaba, Delta State, the union described the practice as modern day slavery that must stop. TVC News Senior Correspondent Sharon Ijasso reports. It's the fifth quadrennial delegates conference of the National Union of Petroleum and Natural Gas Workers, NUPENG, in Asaba, Delta State. At the conference, the president of NUPENG, William Sakuria, called on the monitoring agencies to put a stop to casualization and outsourcing of workers in the oil and gas industry. He described the act as modern-day slavery. I wish to reiterate once again that the level of casualization contract staffing under the guise of outsourcing has returned to slave employment across the oil and gas industry. Especially we where core activities of oil and gas operations in companies are carried out by casual workers is gradually spelling doom for the industry, if not checked, as high productivity cannot be expected from those handling critical operations are treated like slaves and are ill-motivated. We have a call on relevant monetary agencies to rise up to the occasion by showing that global standards are maintained on human capital issues across the industry. Speaking on the theme of the conference, Just Energy Transition for Oil and Gas Workers, Social Welfare and Security, Professor Chukumerije Okurike stressed that global warming is real and has much impact on the sector. We have calculated that human activities, what we call anthropogenic activities, have already caused 1.2 degrees of global warming above pre-industrial level. We find that if the global temperature continues to increase at the current rate, global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees by 2030-2052. Other participants spoke on the essence of the theme of discussion. When there was this issue of dispute whether to allow it to be unionized or not, he said every employer in America must allow workers to be unionized. Why? He said workers are the strongest pillar of democracy. And therefore we must understand this, that casualization is evil. And outsourcing of services is evil. It's modern day slavery. M. Sakwerea was re-elected national president of Nupeng to serve for another four years. While the need for decent work to be promoted at all strata is being promoted at this conference held in Delta State, Asaba, for oil and gas workers, a just energy transition is where highly skilled workers in the carbon industries are being retained for the greener industries rather than being made redundant. Sharon Jason, TVC News. And turning attention to security matters now, the leadership of the House of Representatives has met with the nation's security chiefs in a bid to find lasting solutions to the worsening insecurity in Nigeria. At the end of the more than four-hour meeting, both parties expressed hope there would be remarkable improvement in the fight against banditry moving forward. National Assembly correspondent Joke Adisa reports. We had maybe considered to be jokers. After last week's outburst by the deputy speaker over the absence of the security chiefs, all those invited are here to dialogue with the leadership of the House. The spike in banditry attacks in Kaduna State and some other parts of the country is the reason for this gathering. Deputy Speaker Hamid Idris sets the tone for the meeting. The primary aim of any government is to protect life and property. And this is our core mandate as assigned to us by the Constitution, as, and the House is so worried. Thank the security you. chiefs and the Minister of Transport say they are receptive to new ideas that will eliminate insecurity. Stand ready to answer the questions that you have for us with respect to you know, solutions. 
collective solutions to the defense and security issues across the country. We did apply for surveillance, what you mentioned it here, and I may have to respond to that when the committee decides to ask questions on that. And to say that it is also not true that your lawmakers, there is no law that says if you want to do a $3 billion contract, your other business must have gotten to $10 billion. The, major incident happened. the speaker is concerned about the non-implementation of the recommendations of the first National Security Summit brokered by the House. Those resolutions were presented to Mr. President uh, sometime last year by the whole leadership. And I believe many of you, many of the service chiefs were present and you had copies of, the, of those resolutions. Uh, we want to find out how far with those resolutions. The meeting was then taken off the glare of cameras and the doors were shut. After more than four hours, the meeting ended on a fruitful note. We talked about um, training and retraining. We talked about the issue of capacity and allowances. But we talked about several, several things. A lot of them, like I said, touch on security. But for us to have been in there for four or five hours, um, you must know that we've, uh, we've made some, uh, um, some good headway. Expectations are that are rising from the outcome of this intervention, Cardinal State and indeed other parts of the country will have some respite from recurring insecurity. Choke Adza, TVC News. And joining me now to this course, the spate of insecurity in the country is the Secretary, Retired Military Veterans Federation of Nigeria, Dr. Awal Abdullahi Aliyu. Good to have you join us, Dr. Aliyu. Thank you very much. So let me ask you how, how this comes to you. Um, this is the second time that a military base, in, re in recent times, that a military base in um, Kaduna will be attacked. We saw the, um, I think it was the Nigerian Defense Academy that was attacked as well um, sometime in August last year, and then we're seeing this this year. How do you interpret, it, interpret this, um, especially because of your own experience in the military? Well, it is quite unfortunate and then uh, very disheartening that we are finding ourselves in this kind of a situation. Uh, it is equally unexpected. But then, as a military, uh, they are we are supposed to be, the military is supposed to be up and doing, the military is supposed to be uh, ready for every possible uh, challenge within or even outside the country. Uh, this is even a local one, but even at that, uh, the military has been hitched to it, uh, which is, like I said, very, very disheartening and unfortunate. But that is not to say that the military does not have the capacity to confront whoever or whatever uh, group, either as a group or even as individual uh, that is coming with the intention of uh, trying to ground or disrupt uh, national security. You know, I know, every Nigerian know that uh, Nigerian military internationally are recognized as one of the best ground army, most especially the land army uh, worldwide are recognized as one of the best. Unfortunately, what is happening in Nigeria today most especially, uh, if you like, northwestern Nigeria or in the north entirely, is a challenge uh, or a war that is more like a guerrilla warfare. And the world over, where you have a guerrilla warfare kind of a war, this, you cannot determine how it comes, when it comes, where it will go, who are the people involved. You don't even know who you are fighting. That is one of the basic challenge with a guerrilla warfare. And the tactics these people are applying is a guerrilla warfare kind of a tactic. Even though we are supposed to have counter-insurgency and then uh, counter-terrorism uh, in the armed forces. But then, uh, like I said, just like the military is thinking, these people are also thinking and thinking fast. If you allow me, I would even say that they are thinking far ahead uh, than the military because uh, they are the ones doing attacking now. They are putting the armed forces at the defensive uh, uh, side. Instead of the armed forces putting them at the defensive side, they are the ones putting armed forces at the defensive side. So mm. it is when they attack, that is when a repressal attack will not come in. And they will attack when you don't expect, where you don't expect, and then and, 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 and Dr. Liu, uh, attack and get away with it. Dr. Liu, that, that is the biggest challenge. No one is questioning the capacity of, of our military. Uh, we, we know their capacity mm. quite all right. But the, the biggest challenge people have here is how come we are always reacting and, and not preventing? And it, uh, from what you said, it, it almost sounds as though you're saying that there is an intelligence gap. So how do we get on that? How do we ensure that we are ahead of these bandits and not reacting to the attacks? That, that is absolutely correct. Intelligence gap. The intelligence gathering mechanism is lacking behind. There is no proper coordination 
there is no proper cooperation. There must be cooperation among all security uh, sister agencies, from the armed forces to the police to the DSS to the civil defense, this including uh, even the prison waters, uh, uh, immigration, customs. Uh, you must work, you must interface with one another, you must work as a team in order to share intelligence, to analyze intelligence, and then to also strategize for reaction. That is part of this gap that we are having on one part. On the other part, it is not only intelligence uh, gathering is very, very important in winning a war situation. When there's no credible intelligence, and with the credible intelligence, when there's no reaction, immediately there's intelligence, you will find the lacuna that we are having now, and naturally, uh, those people will be having their way. So there must be, like I said, cooperation, there must be coordination, there must be uh, understanding, there must be unity of purpose, there must be that commitment and patriotism, mm. there must be teamwork among all security uh, organizations, uh, both the armed forces and the paramilitary associations. You must do that. Do not only that. There is very serious need for engagement and involvement of all stakeholders in order to fight uh, these security challenges. Don't forget, security is everybody's business. It's not just the business of security agencies alone or the business of government alone. Every stakeholder, every Nigerian is a stakeholder of Nigerian security. Security starts from individual to the home, to the clan, to the community, to the local government, to the state and the nation by extension. So everybody must be involved in issues that has to do with security. We must accept that there is a lacuna. We must accept that there is a gap. We must accept that we need to carry people along, that the security agencies need to carry people along in order to achieve results. It is not an issue of grandstanding. It is not an issue of we know it all. No, this thing has proved to Nigerians and even the security agencies themselves. Um, Dr. Lee, I, I have just a few seconds left, just really uh, maybe about 30 seconds. But I just want to ask you what you make of the body language at the top. Because again, we have a commander in chief. Whilst, the mili whilst security is everybody's business, but you know, I mean, it is one person's job because that's the job of government, the security, the protection of mm -hmm. lives and property. And um, what do you make of the, of the body language at the, at the top? And that, I'm talking about the body language of the president, who is the commander in chief of the emphasis. Believe me, believe me, believe me. I know the president personally and I know his reaction. And apart from that, uh, every Nigerian will agree that President Muhammad Buhari would love a situation where he will be leaving government, leaving government with a peaceful Nigeria, where Nigeria is peaceful, where Nigeria is habitable. No president, not even Muhammad Buhari, no president of any country that will want to have security challenges in his government under his leadership because it will be counted for him in future. When you are counting success and failures of government, you will count that up as part of his success or part of his failure. So naturally, he will not want it. But remember, he alone, even though a retired general, a former military head of state, now a civilian president, he cannot do it himself. He has to appoint people who will do it. Committed people who will have the patriotism, who will have the nationalism, who will have the commitment, wanting to make sure there is peace. And that he has done. He has appointed people who are leading the security architecture of a different security uh, arrangement. It is their responsibility to come up with tactics, process, procedures of ensuring that security is achieved, peace is achieved. Where there's a failure, it is not the failure uh, of the president and commander-in-chief, it's the failure of those that are at the helm of affairs of security. If they cannot put their ass together, mm. if they cannot galvanize, if they cannot create right. situations um, where they will interface, Dr. Lee, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there, but I'm sure that people, some people will blame, uh, put this at the top in terms of directive. Others will say um, it, probably about uh, following through those directive. But whatever it is, Nigerians just want a solution to this. Thank you so much for talking to us. Um, Secretary, retired Military Veterans Federation of Nigeria, Dr. Awal um, Abdullahi Ali. Thank you very much talking politics now the independent national electoral commission is talking tough ahead the 2023 general elections the electoral body says political parties should ensure their primaries are properly conducted in line with relevant laws the advice was contained in a statement signed by INEX national commissioner and chairman information and voter education committee festo sukui 
Mr. Okoye warned that the electoral agency will not hesitate to disqualify parties in primaries that do not adhere strictly to the principles of internal democracy. He also advised parties to avoid contentious primaries that may lead to unnecessary lawsuits. And still talking politics, Governor Darius Ishaku has assured that he will not take for granted the confidence reposed in him by a coalition of southern Taraba groups who purchased for him the nomination and expression of interest forms for the PDP senatorial race. While receiving the form, the governor promised to offer quality representation if elected in 2023. We have details in this report. Governor Darius Ishaku is far the only person from the ruling People's Democratic Party vying for the senatorial seat from the southern Taraba district. The deadline for the sales of nomination forms, according to the PDP timetable, will soon run out. A coalition of political stakeholders made up of women, youth and community leaders from the zone bought the form and have now presented it to him. They urge him to give the zone purposeful representation. Election Executive of Southern Taraba, the Senatorial Zone, to present this to the man after our heart. While receiving the form, Governor Dara Sishako says politics is about service to the people. It would be insensitive of him to refuse the call by stakeholders to represent them in the Senate. This is one of my happiest moments uh, in this job. You know, when you work and people appreciate you, it is uh, indeed very, it's a moment of uh, being happy. He urged Tarabans to pray to God for a good successor who will be prepared to build on the achievement he recorded. He assured the people of Southern Taraba that he will not disappoint them as their senator. I have stepped forward and done my bit. Somebody will come and take over. Let him also step forward and do his bit. Many aspirants have indicated interest for elected posts in PDP and APC. Among them are retired Chief Superintendent Jafar Shiroma. To rule the Nigerian police that I have loved so much and I hate to leave. But Allah has no why I'm better that I have resigned. Because I think and I feel Joining politics is another arena for me to serve my community better. Taraba State has voted PDP since the inception of present democracy. But at this time around, the race in the three senatorial zone will not be an easy ride for the PDP as its candidate will have to take on formidable opponents from the opposition AP. And talking health now, the nursing profession has taken a dip in Nigeria due to complaints by the caregivers that their professional needs are not being met by the government. In our next report, senior correspondent Jacqueline Ogo takes a look at some of the challenges of the nursing profession. The nursing profession is designed to be a major propeller of efficient service delivery in the health sector. Nurses in Nigeria say they pile up key services with what they describe as discouraging remunerations. At this graduation ceremony of fellows of the Nigeria chapter of the West African Postgraduate College of Midwives and Nurses in Lagos, the challenges of the nursing profession, now made more glaring by the COVID-19 pandemic, took the front burner. Some develop mental health uh, complications, some develop severe respiratory problems, and a lot of them die in the process. Many Nigerian nurses are more in love with the nation's international airports than with its hospitals because they see their flights out of the country as the real solution to the realistic achievement of their professional aspirations. Almost every day, nurses are dropping letter of resignation, letter of voluntary retirement, letter of abscondment, if it's possible. The nurses are highly upset about their 5,000 Naira hazard allowance, which they describe as very ugly. 
They say they are also tired of families of patients harassing them during emergencies because they believe they should be able to perform some forms of wonders. In terms of their training, the training is first class. I can tell you that. But they don't have the resources, the equipment and the environment and the motivation to work. Yes, better budgets for the health sector. Health sector. Then also, nurses should be well recognized. Lagos State Government averted a strike by nurses in the state in January with a pledge to give attention to a 13 point demand they presented. Despite that, nurses are still leaving the state daily as well as the nation. Watchers of the nation's healthcare sector say to avert the crippling effect of negative reactions by nurses and other healthcare providers, the government must rise up with adequate solutions much faster than usual. Jacqueline Ogo, TVC News, Lagos. Now to the nation's capital, the federal government has created a bureau charged with the protection of data. The Bureau's logo, website and core values was launched by the Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, Dr. Issa Pantami and Celestine Naira reports. And after this report, um, we'll return with business updates. Stay with us. Before the advent of national data protection regulations, organizations had no functional accountability system for data privacy. NDPR created a functional accountability system for data privacy from zero data privacy audit compliance in 2018 to 635 in 2020. The top performing sectors are finance 41%, consultancy 9.2%, ICT and digital media 8.8% and manufacturing 7.9%. In order to build the requisite indigenous capability for driving the digital sector, the Minister of Communication and the Digital yes, Economy does. has officially launched the Nigerian Data Protection Bureau, a certified body of national data protection regulations. Data generation is increasing. That is what brought about datafication of society. It is because of this we feel it is necessary in a country like Nigeria that we are blessed with a huge population and the population is also increasing by the day, there is need for us to have an institution of government that will be mandated with data privacy, data security, and data confidentiality. When you put your data there, what is your right? In terms of your consent, in terms of security of what you are giving there, in terms of storage, in terms of availability of the data, in terms of security. Digital economy thing, people don't even understand what we are doing, but now we all know, even the marketers, the local people doing businesses in local markets, they now know what digital economy is today. We in UMC, we store the, the identity data of personal, uh, uh, of the citizens and legal residents. And we also believe that it's the, really the most important uh, data that is being kept about people. The NDPB is a product of a subsidiary legislator of a Nigerian Information Technology Development Agency passed on the 25th of January 2019. Data privacy issues can mar or make democracies and literally undermine a country's national security and bring far-reaching down consequences to the country and its people. Celestina Iria, TVC News, Abuja. I'll start off with the private sector credit in Nigeria, which has hit unprecedented levels standing at 24.45 trillion naira as of the end of January this year, which represents a whopping 4.19 trillion naira year-on-year -year increase. Now, according to the latest data from the Central Bank of Nigeria, Nigeria's private sector credit has been on a consistent rise since June 2020, which is the latest being a 68 billion naira increase from the 24.38 trillion naira recorded as of December last year to 24.45 trillion naira by the end of January this year. Similarly, bank credit to the private sector had increased by 366.14 billion naira in December last year and 687.95 billion naira in the previous month. Now, on the other hand, banks reduced their credit risk exposure to the oil and gas industry, dropping to 17.3% 
as of January 2022 from 19.35% recorded as of the correspondent period of last year. A further look at the data from the Central Bank of Nigeria shows that the downstream oil and gas sector is the highest receiver of bank credit with 4.23% trillion naira as of January 2022, which accounts for about 17.3% of the total private sector credit, followed closely by the manufacturing sector with a total credit of 4.19 trillion naira as of the review period. And I'll still stay with reports within the financial sector. The total assets of Nigeria's microfinance banks increased to 1.35 trillion naira by the end of September last year, from 856.3 billion naira recorded in September 2020. Well, that's according to the latest report from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Now, the Apex Bank in its quarterly report on microfinance banks account assets also shows that the number of microfinance banks rose from 876 as of June 30th, 2021 to 882. As of December the 31st, 2021, now the bank also reports that the banks are contending with challenges such as inadequate capital base, weak corporate governance, ineffective risk management practices, dirt of requisite capacity and also mission drift. It however also urges them to explore the possibilities of mergers and acquisition and also direct injection of funds. While the new capital took effect for new application for microfinance bank licenses, existing banks were given till April 2020 to meet the new requirement. And away from uh, that now, uh, Mine Builders School have won the second phase of the Dodo Mayana Soccerthon uh, under 13 championship in Lagos. The championship was organized by former goalkeeper of the Super Eagles, Peter Rafai. Uh, correspondent Solomon Ajizogo was there. The second phase of the Dodo Mayana Soccerthon DMS under 13 championship got underway with Mine Builder School taking on Scholars Crest International School. Ibrahim Aminu was the starman as he scored the goals which gave Mind Builders a 2 1 victory. The Mind Builders returned to the field to win their second match of the three team tournament by beating the unique school 1 0. It has been great and it has been a very exquisite journey for my team and I to win this competition. After in one of their two games, Scholars Crest International School came second. It's very good, had fun. Put together by former goalkeeper of the Super Eagles, Peter Rufai, the DMS Under 13 Championship is aimed at helping to raise and develop future football stars in the country. Objective of this is to ensure that uh, mistakes made uh, during my time in football uh, when I was coming up and many of my colleagues. Uh, are not made this time around with our upcoming uh, children. And, and this is the reason why uh, we have to t uh, organize this championship at this tender age for them and discover them at the most tender age possible. Looking at what FIFA as well encourages, whereby they encourage uh, football and education, which assists in building strength among the young ones, building stamina, encourages teamwork. So this will enable us to identify young girls that we can invite to the co football under 13 and under 15. Since I started running the school, I found out that the only way I can encourage the younger Nigerians is by encouraging football at this stage so that their talent can be identified early enough so that in case they want to be big or they want to be professional, they can start very early. The children, the teachers and the parents will look forward to another phase and edition of the Dodomayana Soccerthon as a continuous opportunity for football development. Salomon Ajiziogu, TVC News, Lagos.